All right. I think we will get started this evening. We're back. We are back for our, our speaker series for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I want to welcome everyone in our audience and via Zoom. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy this evening's program. We've had Matt Valencic speak with us, I think via Zoom, it was maybe uh, during COVID, uh, and did a, some presentation. I kept, don't remember which one. Oh, it probably was Warbler, yes. Okay, wonderful. So here we are uh, in our new uh, new year, I guess. New year season, yeah. All right, so next, please. There we are. This So this is me. My name is Nancy Howell. I'm a board member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, just in case you didn't know. And uh, so how was your summer? We already covered that. And uh, these are some of the other things I'm going to mention as we go along. There's a lot of things going on. Um, so be, you know, becoming a member, our membership year has started, new membership year has started, the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, uh, Headlands Birding Fest, and, and much more. So let's uh, click through. All right, so please, if you, can sign up for our e-newsletter, which comes out uh, every week, usually, um, or usually a, a Tuesday, maybe a, sometimes a Wednesday, and it gives you updated information. Yes, it covers things that are happening uh, like tonight or this week or a little bit later, but you know, we might get something real quickly sent to us and we want to get it out to all of our members. So signing up for that e-newsletter um, and it comes through MailChimp um, and then you can, you know, if you say, oh man, this is just too much, you can unsubscribe at any time. Yes. MailChimp is, a, a, I guess, what we would call that, a, a, a way to a service to send email, um, things like uh, our newsletters. No, it's not a website. It's a, I don't even, yeah, I guess it is like a mail service, but it's but it's electronic. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, please do become a member. You could do that tonight or sign up uh, on our website. Next. Okay. So maybe you've heard that Rocket Mortgage Field House has been putting up. I don't know if it's. 100% completed yet, but they have been putting up um, things on the windows, treatment on the windows to repel or keep birds from crashing into the windows. Um, there's a, that you see, that's a lot of a lot of glass on that structure. So, but the important thing is that they need to be thanked for doing this. Um, so, sending a very short, a nice positive email to the senior architect, as well as the VP of sustainability. If you wanna take a picture of this, of this screen, you can, a screenshot, but it's in our newsletter as well. Uh, so just uh, again, something real quick. I sent a letter or a note to them on behalf of the board and our chapter members, but hearing from people uh, one by one, I think would really, really again push uh, them to not only them to, but other buildings. You know, we're going to be trying to keep other buildings uh, from putting in glass or reflective surfaces uh, in the future, and hopefully try to work with the city of Cleveland there uh, to to again hopefully get some laws or some kind of things passed so that glass has to be bird friendly. So keep it positive. That's the important thing. Next. I want to mention the Headlands Birding Festival. Uh, this is put on by the city of Mentor, um, but you can see there are a lot of other organizations that are also part of the uh, birding festival, September 20th through 22nd. Um, if you are looking to uh, do some of the events, uh, activities, uh, stay in town or stay in uh, near Mentor, please go through their Headlands Birding Festival 
dot com uh, information. Next, please. And maybe Matt will help me out with this. But I wanted to toss this in too. The Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland does their Chagrin River Bird Quest. And it is coming up this uh, week, this weekend. I'm sorry, it's short notice, but that's the way things fell. Um, you can look up more on the Chagrin River Bird Quest 2024 through the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland website. Um, there's check-in on Friday. There, oh, look at you get t-shirts and all kinds of stuff and food and I guess there's gatherings and you go out. I guess teams go out. Is that right, Matt? Yeah. And you go out and you shot your bird within. You go out and bird within the Chagrin River watershed. It's since we have the Chagrin River watershed um, IBA in our geography as Greater Cleveland, we do things annually to try to contribute to the IBA database, just like you would probably be with the Cuyahoga River and that. And so bird within there, we give you a list of almost 50 locations that are publicly available parks and public access sites where you can go bird. And um, you start at four o'clock on Friday and you finish at four o'clock on Saturday. That's so that it allows people who want to go and get some owls at night, if you know where to go for owls, or you want to attend our owl prowl, um, that sort of a thing. So website's got all the information. Um, uh, if you do that, do it tonight because we just put in our order for food and um, they don't they don't like us to adjust it anymore. So, but please, if you want to put in a team, the team is two or more. Family, you don't have to all be expert birders. Take one birder, bring a friend or two and then come have fun. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for more information. All right, next, please. Uh, please don't forget that Migratory Bird World Migratory Bird Day takes place on the second Saturday of October. There's one in spring and one in fall. Um, so our, you know, we have our second Saturday bird walk on that day. Um, but it's important to protect the birds, protect habitat, and for this year's Migratory Bird Day, as you can see, protect insects as well. So what can you do? Well, protect birds and habitat, do e-bird lists, you know, from your yard, from a park that's nearby, cemetery, whatever. Um, don't mow part of your yard. Plant native plants, help with lights out or donate to the lights out cause. Uh, all the birds that, that strike the buildings that are surviving, go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, and they always need funds to help feed those birds and, and for the care. So there's a lot more that can be done. So again, think about that for that day and, and forever. Next. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get some pumas. Well, not really. Um, PUMA is the banding code for Purple Martin. And I've been working on a project. Lots of still has to be done to get a Purple Martin Colony started at the Cuyahoga County Fairgrounds. Um, I haven't gotten word back from the board at the, the fairgrounds board to say, yeah, go ahead, let's do it. But I, I'm still waiting to hear from them. Um, so we'll have a house or gourds or a, maybe a, a, a both and the accoutrements hopefully will get purchased. Um, we'll have it installed on the, on the fairgrounds property. Um, they'll really enjoy Oktoberfest, the birds, okay? Actually, they're gone now. Uh, and then we'll eventually need volunteers to monitor the nesting of the Purple Martins, sending in the data uh, like we do with the Bluebird Project. We'll send in data to uh, Purple Martin Conservation Association as well as Project Nest Watch. So again, this is still in the works, but I just kind of wanted to... Uh, touch base with that because this is the important part needing some volunteers to help with this project it'll be it'll be a lot of fun all right and I also wanted to mention the uh, Audubon Great Lakes chapter gathering so there are let's see Ohio Indiana Illinois Wisconsin Minnesota, I also believe is involved as those are the um, states 
that the chapter gathering will be taking place. So all the chapters in those in those states can go to uh, get together on Friday, uh, October 18th through Sunday, October 20th. Um, I don't know if we'll have anybody from our board going for this, um, but there's lots of things going on. There was bird walks, uh, registering, talking about how to do a birds and brews demonstration <laughs> and diner can you demonstrate how to do birds and brews here, have some beer <laughs> and some food. Um, Saturday, you can see there's there'll be presentations, breakout sessions. Again, to get chapters involved, to get chapters talking. Hey, what works with your chapter? Oh, this works with us. We we got you know X many people. Hey, we set up a purple martin colony at such and such. You know this type of thing. So you're spreading information out among chapters uh, of those five states that I mentioned. So if anybody's interested, please let us know. Okay. Next. All righty, Michelle. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so I am running the Zoom meeting this evening. So I just want to say to the Zoomers really quickly here uh, that we have the audio on uh, my computer hooked up to the speakers. So if you come off of mute, we will be able to hear you in the room, um, which will be great for when it's Q&A time, but not great during the presentation. So try to keep yourselves on mute um, unless you have a question. And likewise, in the room, they cannot hear us on Zoom unless you're holding a microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you so that um, the folks on Zoom can feel like they're really here. All right, so um, I'm going to be discussing uh, the upcoming bird walks this month. We have three of them, uh, as well as how you can connect with us on social media. Our first bird walk is the second Saturday bird walk. Uh, that is on September 14th at 9 a.m. We meet at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Uh, we have four leaders for that walk, Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand um, will be leading that walk. Uh, and it's always a lot of fun. So hope that we see you in a couple of weeks. And then we have our last evening bird walk of the season. Um, I'm getting some feedback. Is that, are you hearing the feedback? Okay, maybe it's just me because I'm standing by the speaker. All right, so our evening bird walk this month is on Wednesday, September 18th. Uh, we meet at 6 p.m. And uh, the location is Fowl's Marsh. So we're meeting at the parking lot um, of the Ingle Road Sledding Hill in Middleburg Heights. And Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk as well. Uh, and finally, our third walk of the month, uh, Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk on Saturday, September 28th. We meet at 9 a.m. Um, and we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of the former Sokolowski's University Inn. Um, Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. And then we are on social media. Um, we're on Facebook. X, which was formerly Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. So please follow us, interact with us. I try to share um, news and other posts of interest on Facebook. I'm trying to get better with Instagram, but you know I post there occasionally as well. Uh, and then be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. We post all of our um, meeting recordings there, um, as well as other events that we have. So um, hope to see you on social media as well. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Marianne. I'm getting a lot of crackling in this, this one. Hey there, I'm Marianne Romito. Um, I am the Northeast Ohio Coordinator for Climate Watch for Audubon. And if you don't know anything about um, I'm getting feedback. Yeah. Um, if you don't know anything about Climate Watch, who, who knows about Climate Watch here? Okay. Okay. For those of you who don't know about the Climate let's, let's Watch, where see what that program. Mm, whatever. Um, it's better. Okay. 
Um, the Climate Watch is a program that's been sponsored by Audubon, National Audubon. And they've, they've gotten, we're, well, we're recruiting volunteers all over the nature to go out, uh, all over the nation to go out and monitor birds, five, well, in our area, it's five different species during summer and winter. The next count that's coming up is the winter count. And you can zip through these because I'm not really following any script today. Um, the winter count is from January the 15th through February the 15th of 25. And you, you if you want to volunteer, you get to go out and you get to count five different species of birds. Something kind of easy. Uh, we've got white-breasted nuthatch, red-breasted nuthatch, goldfinches, uh, bluebird, and towhee. So most people can identify those. And it's not like you're going to see a ton of them anyway in wintertime, so it's not a big deal. Um, yeah, she can. This is my contact information. Um, you can take a picture of this if you wish, or you can just call me and we can talk about it. What we do is I assigned you a, a territory depending on where you live. We try to make it close by, but sometimes they might be taken by somebody else. Um, and and I walk you through how to. I, I can walk you through how to do the survey. It's really not that difficult. Um, and and if you're interested, give me a call. Um, what the other thing? Oh, I have some calendars in the back on the back table. There, there's three calendars back there that are free. Take them. Anybody who wants them. And if you're interested in astrology, I have a special calendar. Come see me at the end. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the Climate Watch date that we would like to get most of the surveys done is the Saturday, January 18th. You don't have to do that date. It can be anywhere, as Marianne said, between January 15th and February 15th. But um, if we, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so providing the weather's good, as, as Marianne said. Yep. All right, next, please. All right, Drina. Howdy, everybody. Well, it's hard to believe that we're going into our fifth season of the book club, and we have to thank the pandemic for that, because that's what got us started. So five years. Next slide, please. So for this year, we have three selections and starting just next month already, uh, 10 Birds That Changed the World by Stephen Moss, who is a British naturalist, uh, does a lot of TV work. Um, and we meet on Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. Then coming up in January, we're going to read uh, Ken with two N's, Ken Kaufman's latest book, The Birds That Audubon Missed. And he talks about a lot of birds that Audubon just didn't address, but he also imitates Audubon with his artwork. So I did not know that he was an artist. But And then in April, we'll be uh, reading The Big Year, um, A Tale of Man, Nature, and Fowl Obsession by Mark Omachik. Not sure if I'm getting that right. And next slide, please. And since there's a movie of that, I thought, why don't we watch the movie too and talk about both when we meet that evening? So um, the movie is available right now, uh, streaming on Disney Plus or Hulu, but you can also rent it or buy it if you'd like uh, on Amazon, Apple, or Microsoft Store. Uh, a DVD is available through the Cleveland Public Library system. And uh, Nancy mentioned the Mentor Headlands Birding Festival uh, coming up September 20th through the 22nd. And Greg Miller, who is one of the three birders originally, is going to be the uh, speaker on Saturday evening. So coincides well with our, our year. Next slide, please. So I always like to mention uh, David Lindo because he has such a, a great variety of speakers on his on his webinars. And the next one coming up is not until November, but it looks like it's going to be dynamite. 
And for those of you who have difficulty identifying flycatchers, uh, I most certainly do. Uh, he has two experts on this with uh, a book that is just coming out that they have done, and I don't have the name of it right with me. So you can check um, also David Lindo's David Lindo's UrbanBirderWorld.com for past meetings too. He has three years worth of wonderful interviews. Next slide, please. And then um, our previous discussion from the past four seasons are available um, through uh, the WCAS website. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drina. Um, books are great. Um, it's lovely to to sit in your at your home and and re have the book available and discuss it. It's it's really fun. So, next, Amanda Sobroski talking about our well, who's our coffee coordinator? Our bird friendly coffee. Thanks. Is there another one? Oh, good. Um, well, it's that time again. It's time to order coffee. Our next order goes in October 6th. It'll be the last order before Thanksgiving. Or, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. So if you need it for your parties and for presents, you need to get the orders in. So I'd like to have the orders in on the 9th, the, the, uh, by midnight of the 9th. Anyway, um, I know you've heard this before, but the coffee's uh, really important to as a uh, money maker for the club, but also because it's good for the environment and the birds. It um, is shade grown, so the rainforests are not destroyed. It's organic, so poisons aren't poured into the environment and into us and into the animals. And it's fair market, so the farmers are paid uh, a living wage. Not only that, be because the rainforests aren't taken down, it provides the farmers with a secondary means of income because they're able to forage for like medicinal herbs. So um, I guess that's it. Did I miss anything? Oh yeah, there we have these cards that um, serve as good reminders and also you could pass them out and maybe get other people to um, buy the coffee because it has a lot of good benefits. And these will be on the back table. Next. All right. So um, there is lots of things going on at the back table. There are newsletters, there are brochures and pamphlets. There are, um, well, the coffee, the coffee cards that you can pick up, take a, take a bunch of them. We got a lot. So if you go into an office and you might set them somewhere where people may pick them up and, and consider talking with us about that. Um, but it's good. So in October, we are having one of our members, Andrew Steinman, will be talking about birding the heart of the Amazon. I can't wait to hear that. I I just love the birds that can be found uh, in the Amazon region. Could be some super exotic things. It might be some of our, I don't know, the birds that we that we see up here in the summertime that head down there. So if that's Tuesday, October 1st, please notice the time. It is half an hour later. There's something going on in this room at uh, until seven. So we had to push our, our meeting back a little bit. So please, and we'll highlight this uh, as we send out information for the next uh, speaker program. But this evening, next, uh, we have Matt Valencic, who is uh, will be speaking on the uh, wetland birds of the Eastern US. And as you can see, Matt, uh, he caught the birding bug during college at Cranberry Lake Biological Station in the Adirondacks, where he saw his first Blackburnian warbler. I, is that your spark bird too? Anybody, anybody? All right. Um, and he hasn't been the same since. Uh, since retiring in 2015, symptoms have worsened. Oh dear, uh, because he has more time to go birding, which is really nice. He caught the bird photography bug from one of his sons and his birding programs are an outlet for all of the pictures he has accumulated. Matt says he's far from an expert about birds, 
but in creating programs, he has learned a great deal about birds and enjoys sharing that knowledge. Uh, educational programming is part of the mission of the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, where he is chair of the education committee and a trustee. He and his wife, Patty, live on a small hobby farm in Geauga County. They have three children, nine grandchildren, and all of them enjoy being in the outdoors. So please, let's welcome Matt Valencic. Thank you, Nancy. Um, two quick comments on what was already stated. Um, the Big Year book, if you saw the movie, forget it. Read the book. It's a much better read for a birder. I read that before the book or before the movie ever came out. You will thoroughly enjoy it. And the Birding Festival and Mentor at the end of the month. If you are looking at binoculars, you know anybody who's looking at binoculars, Time and Optics will have their optics tent there, just like they do at uh, the biggest week of birding. That's the place. Try them before you buy them. And that's the key thing that we all, all of us who teach introductory birding, try them before you buy them. So I'm going to uh, get right into things here since I'm abbreviated on time. Um, next, uh, I wish I could click my own. I feel like I'm tied. Can I? Thank you. Oh, bless you, my child. <laughs> and just the upward button on top of the right side. Right. Sorry, Zoom people. We're trying to learn how to do this first of the season here. So um, yes, I'm not an expert, but you become an expert when you have to teach something. And these were the places that I went to get more interesting things besides just showing you my pictures. It'll put you to sleep fairly quickly. Um, so allaboutbirds.org, you all, if you're active birders, you know that. Sibley's The Big Book, not The Field Guide, The Big Book, and 50 Years of Birding. Um, so uh, you already know a little of my history. This is my own photography, unless I inserted one or two pictures. I don't think this particular presentation has one. And if you're interested in the camera I have, it's an ADD, 80 uh, D, and uh, second generation 100 to 400 lens. I am thinking about the uh, mirrorless Canon R7. If any of you know that, uh, it's a mirrorless camera that will improve the optics of my scope. Um, so we're looking good here. Beauty, wonder, and awe, that's the reason we have to care about birds, okay? And um, and if we do that, I want you to see what some beauty, wonder, and awe looks like. This is a rookery at the Pinkney National Wildlife Refuge in South Carolina. And these are all different wading birds that we're going to talk about tonight that are nesting in the same wetland, okay? There's egrets and herons and ibis and night herons and blackbirds and alligators and all kinds of cool stuff in here. Um, it's just before you go across the bridge onto Hilton Head Island, it's publicly accessible. It is the most amazing thing. And it's a 10 minute walk from your car to get there and you walk around it. It's about two or three acres in size and the craziest bunch of things you'll ever see. And it's these birds that cause this presentation to get put together. Um, we've seen some of them around our area and uh, some we don't, but um, what are wetlands and why do they matter? Let me do this here because I wanna make sure I, I do justice to this here. Um, they are places that hold water some or all of the year, okay? They are filters for the water that comes into the environment, uh, whether it be by rain or runoff from different things. They are the most biologically diverse habitats uh, on the face of the earth because they support both aquatic and, um, and uh, terrestrial plants and animals. They provide nesting and resting cover for migrating waterfowl as well as migrating passerines, all different kinds of things. Um, they, they're just amazing places that if you're looking for peace, you can find it. Uh, once you get there, there's so much to see and do, you will forget about everything else that was going on before you showed up. And um, even if you just take pictures with your cell phone, um, I think you'll totally enjoy it. So the kind of birds that can be found there, we're gonna just show you the whole list here. There's a little bit of everything. Again, terrestrial birds on the margins of the wetland, um, all the waterfowl and wading birds and marsh birds of that within the actual thing where they get their little feet wet. So we're gonna, 
quickly go over most of these, except the Raptors. I have another Raptor talk if you're looking to fill time. Um, there's uh, some of those. So there's about 19 wading birds that I include in here. There's a couple things that we don't talk about because we don't see them much. Um, but uh, these are the birds, the ibises, the night herons, um, wood stork, uh, great blue heron, bitterns, and all this. So let's get right in and start with um, comparing these because egrets and herons get confused a little bit. So one thing they have in common is because of their gorgeous plumage during breeding, they became nearly extinct at the end of the uh, 19th century, the early part of the 20th century. They were being harvested on their breeding grounds for their plumage. And when a group of women in New York City found out where their pretty flowers or their pretty plumes were coming from, they were outraged. And they were the ones who started uh, the, uh, to get against all these guys killing all these birds. And that was the beginning of what led to the Migratory Bird Act that we have in 1918 that says you can't even keep a feather of these birds because we don't know if you picked it up on a bird walk in Rocky River Reservation or you shot a bird so that you could hold its feather. Um, and we know that that seems a little absurd, but um, these are the kind of things that were considered. So we're much better off for the Migratory Bird Act. Uh, herons and egrets hunt similarly. They stalk their prey, usually in the water. They all eat all kinds of stuff. If it moves and it's alive, it's going down. Um, a lot of them breed in rookeries, like you saw here at the very beginning. A few of them nest alone, but um, and then the, a lot of them roost in communal roosts in the evening, which are marvelous. And I'll show you one of those uh, down in Florida. So let's take a look at uh, these egrets that are here. We've got the great egret with the yellow bill and the snowy egrets with the black bills. Yeah, they're feeding. If you watch them in the water. You see some catching fish? So if you've ever been to Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge on Sanibel Island um, off of Fort Myers, Florida, you can enjoy these scenes. Just don't go on Friday because they're closed. The last time I went, I showed up on Friday and my way said, really? Really? You don't know that they were closed on Friday? And so I caught particular grief about that. So, um, but when the tide comes in, they all get together. They're not like a lot of other birds during the breeding season that don't get along well. These guys will, um, and gals will go ahead and fish together and feed their babies and all of that. So let's start with the great egret. We have some of those, you all live closer to Lake Erie than we do. The Lake Erie marshes have them. This is a picture from the boardwalk or the um, causeway at uh, McGee Marsh. Uh, I think that's a pickerel and they eat their fish whole all these egrets and birds like that, but they flip them around first so that the fins fold back because it's not a fun thing to try to get a fin down otherwise. Um, they take these, these fish back to their nests. The babies aren't particularly beautiful at this stage of life, uh, but one of the things they do is they clip onto the parent's bill, snapping on it, and that causes them to regurgitate. And I don't know if you can see that big dark glob coming in there, that was some fish, and that's how the babies are fed. Um, of all these. So they're quite interesting to watch them uh, get fed like this. The birds are incredibly beautiful in breeding season. Just the little, well, the white itself is stunning, as we know. But um, the, the color contrast of the yellow to the greens, you're going to see different color bare skin on some of these birds uh, during their breeding season and the contrast of the eyes. Notice there is not these big plumes coming off the back of their head. So these are egrets and they tend not to have those plumes. They're going to have their plumes on their uh, wing feathers and so on. Right here in your own Sandy Ridge Reservation uh, several years ago, that just made for an interesting picture, how they get along. Back down to Pinckney National Wildlife Refuge, snowy egrets with the, what do we call those feet? Golden slippers, that's right. So they're told apart from the great egrets because number one, they're smaller, but size is always difficult if you don't have something to compare it to. And they have black bills instead of yellow. And they have those lovely black legs with um, yellow feet at the end that look like gold slippers. Uh, you get a little more close up of them right there. Okay, this is that go gorgeous plumage that um, the people in the end of the 19th century were plucking and putting into hats. 
Uh, so you can see where the, I mean, this is this is beauty, wonder, and awe. Remember those three words from the beginning. That's what uh, birds are all about. So this is a gorgeous scene here. You see the baby squawking in the background because probably mom or dad here, whoever this was, uh, was already empty. Um, another one here where uh, they do the same thing that the great egrets do. The babies chomp on the bill, causes them to... Uh, regurgitate whatever they found. And even as little babies, they're learning how to do that by snapping on the legs. So yeah, they're cute. I've got two things. So usually I have a, a, a pointer here, but um, you're just going to have to believe me here and follow. They catch the tiniest of things. You wonder how they can make a living, so to speak, by eating these tiny fish, but they do this from daylight to dark. So um, and manage to make it. And every once in a while, they get a good one. One of the things all these wading birds do is they stir the floor, the mud in the water and try to kick things out of it. And then they watch for it to see, um, uh, to see what comes out and they go to snatch it like that. A pointer in there? Oh, well, we'll okay. Um, next bird is a cattle egret. Um, we started calling it the Western cattle egret not too long ago because it covers a lot of areas in the Western part of the world, I guess. Um, breeding plumage, it goes from all white to this lovely tan color on the back and the face is just again stunning with the with the bare skin on there and the contrast of the eyes and the bills um i thought about doing a whole talk on eyes but i'll leave that for jim tomko our president who's an optometrist um maybe i'll just supply him with some pictures and let him talk more about uh things ocular okay so these guys while they're in the marsh and they will uh, they'll breed in the marsh and so on and all that but they also are all over if you've ever gone to Disney your first time and you're driving from the rental car company to the park every ditch has these guys in it right and here's kind of what they look like chasing the tractor for insects If you don't like the videos, blame one of my colleagues from um, the Master Gardener program who told me I needed to include more video in my talks. So uh, again, these guys will eat anything, insects and even toads. So that's pretty gross. Um, there's a group of, you see them again along the roadsides, um, in the ditches, near the highways and all this sort of a thing. Ah, the reddish egret. This is your, um, this is your great egret with ADHD, okay? It's hyperactive. I, I don't have video of it, but it bounces around in there like a, like a crazy bird. And it's stirring things up and it's running like crazy. Instead of just standing there and shaking his foot, it runs itself all around and looks to see what comes up. So how do we tell this bird besides its plumage, which can vary? We look at bills again. And here's the bill that is uh, flesh colored at the base with a black tip. Uh, we all know about looking for our field marks on the bird. So that's one of the things to, to look for here. In its early the first year, um, it's more drab gray. It almost looks like a, um, a, little, a little heron, a little blue heron, I'm sorry. And, uh, but it will uh, eventually morph out. There is a rare white morph. If you go down to Texas, this was from um, Port Aransas area. Uh, you can find the white morph of the reddish egret. So um, just like every once in a while, we get leucistic birds with a lot of white in them. This is, but this is a full morph, just like our um, snow goose. We have the blue goose, they, the hunters call it, which is just a dark phase of the snow goose. Ah, the rare and elusive great blue heron. So, yeah, that's really my line for, uh, I always introduce the, the rare and elusive uh, Canada goose. Um, but these guys, they're, uh, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Thank goodness. There's those plumes now coming off the head of the herons, okay, uh, in breeding plumage. Um, just stunning colors on here. As we all know, they're in rookeries. Um, and you wonder how they can support an egg in those flimsy nests, let alone babies. But they manage to do it. Um, we have a new wetland. If you haven't been in Geauga County, the very south end of it, just a few minutes north of Hiram College, is Troy Wetlands. And it was a, it was a property that was owned by Geauga Parks for many years, and they just put a trail in there and an observation deck. And the biggest worry was, would they disturb the blue heron rookery? And the answer was no. So there were seven or eight active nests. The only one that was not active this breeding season, the first year the parks opened, is the one right by the boardwalk. And that would be expected. But all the other ones that were out 100 or 150 yards away from the observation platform 
all had at least two babies. One of them had three. So really fortunate to have another rookery around. This is Ledoux Reservoir. And I watched this bird catch three bass that size. Now, if you're a fisher person, um, that's fun to catch, something like that. Whether you want to eat them or not, that's another thing. But flip them up and get them on down, okay? And he did this three times. And I'll show you what he did afterwards. Um, they eat a lot of catfish. But one of the things they do, this is at Sandy Ridge. They pierce them and they smack them against the ground. And the reason they're doing that is these three spines. If you're a fisher person, you know there's a spine here, a spine here, and a spine here. And if that goes down, it's getting stuck. So they smack these catfish against the ground until they break those spines off. And then down they go. They must know how to do it because they keep catching them, okay? They're not like an eagle that can just chew it apart and leave, the, leave it behind. This is the dumbest thing. This was at... Um, on the auto tour at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge several years ago, and my friend saw it at a distance. It's a terrible picture because it is so zoomed in, but it was way out of range. But that big old goldfish, and we don't know if it ever got it down or not. We sort of, somebody spotted a better bird and we stopped looking at it. And by the time we went back, it was gone. This bird walks on water. So it does that. And you only know one other person who walked on water, right? So, but... So there you go. It walks on water. That was after it caught all those bass. It felt that good. Uh, the little green heron, we used to call them different things, but um, this one you don't see as much because it's a little, it's smaller and it hangs out in all those reeds and stuff and along the edges. Um, you're lucky you see them throughout the year. If you go to parks where they, they hang out, they sort of tolerate us after a while. This is down at uh, Ding Darling again. They, they just roost together next to the teal. Uh, it was kind of nice in there. It was good night light. Everybody know, any camera people out there, you know the golden hours in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, so it's wonderful. This is at the Cuyahoga Valley Ira Road Beaver Marsh, where the big boardwalk is. You can walk out there. It was in breeding season. I had the kids there, grandkids, and we were walking around. And this bird just started getting ruffled up and everything. And it was, it was breeding season and everything. And finally, its hair went on fire. So uh, and then it took off. <laughs> so um, lots of fun uh, watching them there. They are the strongest birds. Oh, my gosh. Um, if, if, you, if you've gone to a lot of places uh, where there's marinas and near wetland areas, you will find these guys hanging on the mooring lines of the boats. And they will actually hold on tight and go down for a fish and come back up. And I don't have any pictures of them doing that, but this was one in Florida. He went all the way down that pipe. He's still hanging onto that pipe. Got this stupid little fish. It's like, man, you got, you got to do something more for your effort than that. And I don't have it back here, but it pulled itself back up and stood back up. So they're incredibly strong um, birds. Uh, they do like bullfrog tadpoles. I watched this one catch several of them here. This is at the Rookery in Jaga County, where I live. Uh, Jaga County. So you'll see a lot of Jaga County pictures, but I just love the colors, the gunmetal gray on the back The you can just go on. If you're artistic, you can describe it better. I just appreciate it. Um, when they fly away, they're small birds, not terribly long, but they've got these big wings and that's characteristic of the egrets and the herons as well. So they can, they can really take off, uh, not quite like a duck, a puddle duck that goes exploding off, but when they get going, they, they can really displace a lot of air. The little blue herons start uh, as the adult. It looks like this. Again, look at the bill. Light blue at the base, black at the tip, because we get different color things going on. So when they're born their first year, here we are, you say, oh my gosh, is this a snowy egret, or is this a great egret, or is this the white morph of the reddish egret? Look at the bill. Light blue at the base, black at the tip, green lights. And that's your field marks. And when they're in between and they're molting, you might catch one in this phase right here. Um, they feed their babies the same kind of a way. These are in that same rookery that you saw in the very first shot. And there's the kids waiting. One of the beautiful things about watching them there, if you hang around this rookery, you'll see all the adult birds leave approximately the same time. And they're away for quite a while, and then they seem to come back. And I don't know if it's timed with the outgoing tide and the incoming tide, but when they come back, all the babies that are on the rookery all get hyper. They knew they're coming before you can even see them. I don't know if they hear them or what, but um, they all get alert like this. And then the parents show up and it's just chaos. Everybody's competing for food. Um, here's a handsome one in the rookery after it got done feeding uh, and it just sort of stood there to get its breath again, I guess. 
they eat a lot of fiddler crabs. So, and there's a bazillion. If you've ever gone to the beach down at, uh, on the eastern shore, down in the Gulf Coast, bazillion uh, horseshoe crabs. And they're, they're pretty good. Another first year bird in the rookery. And one out by there. I, if I have a lot of pictures. It, I had to taper this to 40 minutes. And all I'm leaving, I didn't cut any birds out. I just cut a bunch of pictures out. Because I just had a lot of pictures. And I think people count. Anybody remember the old name for this bird? Louisiana, right. So the Louisiana heron. I don't know why they changed it. So side note, I am still angry at whoever it was that changed the golden swamp warbler to become what? Prothonotary. What the heck? Anybody know what prothonotary means? Yeah, but they were the colors of the robes of a Catholic church cleric about three or 400 years ago. I'm sure this is perfectly makes perfectly good sense to somebody. Okay, I'm Catholic too, so it's not like it's anything against the Catholics. But um, yeah, but it, uh, so anyway, tricolored heron. Um, they do have these, these different colors. Again, we're looking at uh, beautiful plumage here and breeding. Again, lovely features on the, on the skin versus the face. This is a smallish bird. It's only about 20 or 24 inches long and like about three quarters of a pound. Um, but they just look massive. And as babies, they're brown and white. They get a little bit more uh, appealing as they get older and then still a little more. But they still have that fuzz on top of the head in here. Um, and then they just have this, look at the outsized bill on that. Um, that that's crazy to me. The other bird that reminds me of this is the Eastern meadow lark that has, I think is an outside bill for outsized bill for its head, head size. Other waiting birds. Okay. Our night herons, the black crown uh, here, we have them all along the Cuyahoga river and a lot of other waterways in the winter time during the day, they, they roost in wetlands like this and vegetation where they stand. They hunt, they will hunt during the day, but they're primarily night hunters. That's where it gets the name. In that same rookery, okay, we have black crowned night herons there at uh, Ibis Pond in Pinckney. So um, here's a, a juvenile, and we're going to compare them to the yellow crown because this always drives us all nuts. Uh, relatively speaking, how big are those white blotches on the brown feathers? That's what we're looking at. But we're also going to talk about the bill, which again, I keep going back to the bill because it's important. Fish Creek over in Northwest Ohio somewhere. I haven't been there in years, but I remember getting this in the dead of winter. Um, the only thing that amazed me more is the ones that are along the Cuyahoga River during the winter time on uh, Collision Bend. This was at McGee Marsh um, along that trail that goes to Crane Creek Trail. We watched this bird. Now, can you see anything in the water through all that vegetation on the surface? This bird did and went down like that came back out, look at the plumes on the back of the head. Here we have heron again. So they got those lovely plumes and got a big sunfish, a bluegill of some kind or another. So um, I don't know how it saw it. We were looking, we didn't see any stirring on the surface, but we don't make our living by having to find bird, uh, fish. So the yellow crown uh, looks a little different. It's more active during the day. Um, obviously different plumage characteristics. We'll see them in these tidal wetlands uh, along the East Coast and down through the Gulf Coast and all of that. When the tide's out or it's very shallow in there, again, there's a bazillion of these fiddler crabs down in there, all about the size of a quarter. There's one that it's eating right now. They find them all over. Just a gorgeous bird, um, hunting them in all these kinds of waters. So if you lived in Columbus, I haven't been down there in many years. I've been retired for nine years already, and this goes back probably six or eight years before then, um, there's a community that looks a lot like Cleveland Heights or Shaker Heights in that there's big old trees overshadowing the, uh, the street. And this is a big sycamore tree. And for years, this pair nested right above the center line of that residential street. Um, there is a wetland nearby, but this is where it chose to put its nest. And it was very cool, especially if you were trying to get black crown night heron on your list for the year. <laughs> I am a shameless lister, by the way. Yes. So. Um, so here we have the yellow crown on the left, the black crown on the right. And uh, well, you can see the markings better here, but you don't typically get these two birds standing side by side in, in the wild. But you do have the bill. And so what do you notice about the bill on the left compared to the bill on the right? It's darker. So the yellow crown on the left has a much darker bill. It's all dark, where the black crown will always have yellow on the lower mandible. 
So again, going back to bills here, trying to separate these. So if these drive you crazy, how about this? American Bittern. And this was at Rocky River Reservation, right on the road that goes along. This is several years ago. It goes back more than nine years. And that bird was there, and I saw it on uh, the Ohio Birds Listserv. Anybody still on the Ohio Birds Listserv? Yeah, those of us that have been around for a while. And sat right on the bike path and took pictures for an hour. Um, but they're beautiful. They, they're camouflage. Most of you know that. But look how they compare to our juvenile night herons. So if you're a newer birder, this will drive you nuts. But don't get crazy, okay, because eventually you will learn it. Just keep coming back at it and working on it. They're in the shallows here. This bird's about 24 inches long, but he weighs a couple of pounds, so he's a more robust bird. Got those big honking feet um, that allow him to stretch over the vegetation. And um, when, they, when they put their neck straight up, they always show the classic picture in cattails where they just blend right in. Um, but there's another picture of the feet. Now we're going to hear the sound, which is one of the nutso sounds. Um, along with a couple of other things out there. How many of you are hearing this for the first time? If you hear that at dusk, or just after dark, and you're in a wetland, especially if you're at, on the auto tour at Ottawa and you're not supposed to be there at that hour of the night, but your friends won't leave and we're going to get locked in, but I say, okay, you guys, you're not doing it. Listen back here. And I heard my first one in there. This is about two years ago. And I refuse to go on the tour with them now if it's after two o'clock in the afternoon because they'll drag their feet just so they could stay there to hear this and all of the other things that night sounds. But they're really cool, um, really cool birds. Again, small fish. They make a living doing this. But they caught that right along the road there uh, in the Rocky River Reservation. Um, the other bittern that we have that we don't see a lot of is the little is the least bittern. And you can see them there in the middle of the picture. Um, this bird is 12 inches long and three ounces. Feathers and hollow bones don't weigh very much. And you can see that it's right. Look how it's hanging onto cattail. It's probably broadleaf cattail, which is better than narrowly, but it's still very, very small. Um, there's a picture. I think this is an internet picture. I don't own anything that beautiful. Um, by the way, Michelle, your pictures in the beginning here that you had up were amazing. Um, uh, but it, they do eat lots of little fish. And this is what we mostly see. If you're in a massive cattail area. You might even hear the bird calling. And then all of a sudden it pops up and it flies across the cattails and it drops into the cattails again. So to have that picture at Ibis Pond a couple of years ago was, was just beautiful to, to experience. Another waiter is in there everywhere too. They're back on that trip. You got you're in the rental car on your way to Disney, okay, with the kids or the grandkids, and you see all these ibises out in the fields, uh, the white ibis. Um, and here we are, and breeding plumage, stunning, stark red against white, just very cool. And look at those eyeballs, almost weird, huh? And but when when the uh, female gets on her nest, which is just a scraggle of these things full of lichens and dirt, it just takes her plumage and makes it yucky. She'll get rid of it later on um, and she'll get pretty again, but um, that's kind of tough. The babies are all dark uh, when they're first born and they don't have that long bill. You can see the bird on the right um, with the flesh color mixed in that's sort of mottled. That's a younger bird than the one on the left. So the bill grows longer as they get older and it gets that decurved um, appearance as well as they get going. In the intermediate time from uh, as they're molting towards their adult plumage, you might find some that look modeled like this. They are one of the birds that likes to go to roost at night once the babies are raised. And you'll find them. There's a great place uh, uh, called Anna Maria Fish House or something in Sarasota. And my wife and I love to go there because we show up an hour early and we sit in front of the hotel that's next door in chairs. And we watch all the birds coming into this resting spot here, this night roost. And it's just a big island of vegetation that nothing can get to. It's surrounded by water. And the herons and the ibises and the egrets and the anhingas, um, they just all come in there. And it's so cool to watch. Here's some at Ding Darling also. They're everywhere. Um, back to Ibis Pond again. They, when the kids are done, they go off of the rookery and they hang out in the trees that surround the place. So uh, it's like, leave me alone. Let the kids all argue there. Uh, they are related to the uh, glossy ibis, but we tend to find these strictly on the shoreline of the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast. 
Um, they, they tend to be in deeper vegetation, not out in the open so much. Uh, and they will be in large flocks sometimes. Here's a first year bird going over. If you ever tried to get the white faced ibis and the glossy ibis kind of a thing, you know, I didn't include the white faced in here because basically it looks like this has just got more white on the face. Um, but they, they'll be in large flocks like this down in uh, the Carolinas and Florida as well. The wood stork, what a weird bird, huh? Okay, uh, I think it's related to the uh, vulture, turkey vulture, or the black vulture. So this is one landing. What bird does it remind you of with big black and white wings? How about the American white pelican? You'll see that in just a second. But there's a reason, just like with the turkey vulture's bare head, because it sticks its head in those gross places and feathers would just be accumulating stuff. This one's head, it's going to be in the water a lot. And you'll see that in just a minute. But does that look like an American white pelican a little at a distance? So um, if you say, well, I don't know, well, start watching in the spring because they move around. There's more of them up along the lakefront around our wildlife refuges and, and those natural areas up there and some of the hunt clubs than they are down here. They hunt by putting their face, that bill in the water into their face. They open the bill slightly and they move it left to right, waiting for something to bump into it. And they also, you can see around their feet, they're stirring their feet there in the bottom to try to stir something up. And they characteristically put their wing out to create a little bit of shade. Because if you've ever been a fisher person, you like to cast towards the edge of the shade and the sun because the bird or the fish don't like to be out in the sun they'll scoot into the shade to be not as obvious. And so it knows that, and it this is one of its characteristics. So nature's so cool. I'm a nerd, by the way, nature nerd. If you if you love birds, you better love plants. And if you love plants, you better love insects And if because the birds eat the insects. And if you love all that stuff, you better love soil. So I'm a master gardener volunteer, and the two, two things couldn't fit better together. Um, here they are at the south end of Hilton Head Island um, near the equestrian center, and they've they've gotten along well with people being around all the time. All these these birds and stuff over at the big resort areas are much easier to get close to. These are the first time I ever saw roseate spoonbills. And what were they in the company of on the left? Wood storks, yeah, plus one great egret that got in there for the photo bombing, if you will. These are really cool birds. As we all know, they they get their color based on the food they eat. They eat some of the shrimp that have these pink colors in them. The bird on the right is a, a younger bird. The bird on the left is a mature adult and photobombing by what bird? No, the middle one, reddish egret. Very good, yes. So I'm re am I repeating everything for the Zoom people well enough, Michelle? Thank you. Okay, again, look at that bill. Flesh colored at the base, black at the tip over there. They were bored with us. Just be good, yawn, yawn. Uh, but it's stunning contrasting colors when you see that stark red in there. Um, and they do preen. We have a short little video here again to add some. Again, you can blame my friend for the Master Guardian program for this. And I don't know how to edit video, so you have to hear all the background sounds. Yeah, okay, that would be the glass. Is that much shrimp here? Must be. I think they're just a lighter pink, and then when they're turning the shrimp, they get darker and darker. Oh, okay. Oh, same as the flamingos. Yeah. Ready? You said as they eat more shrimp, eat more shrimp they get darker pink. Oh, wow. So he mentioned flamingos in there. I don't have flamingos in here because, A, I have never seen them in the wild, and, B, we don't see a lot of them. So um, uh, I need to get them on there. That's another reason to go to Florida, right? So in the winter. Okay, so that's our wading birds. That's a lot of stuff. And we're going to hustle through the rest of this because I'm not sure how far I am into this talk. But um, we're, we're not going to do a lot of the ducks, geese, and swans because I have migrating waterfowl and winter birds talk, which covers all these. But in those wetlands, we have mallards, which have lots of babies. We have wood ducks, which have lots of babies that like to be cavity nesters. Uh, they'll go in a woodpecker hole, a pileated woodpecker hole. They have lots of babies because where they put their babies, there's a lot of big bass and muskies and snapping turtles and babies are at the bottom of the food chain. You're not supposed to have a favorite grandchild or a favorite child or a favorite bird. This is my favorite bird. And yes, I do have a favorite child, So, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. So <laughs> we all do. You're just never allowed to admit that to anybody. I just think I love the, I, I've always liked the wood duck because I was a hunter and I was enamored with where I found them. 
Um, I stopped hunting with shotgun uh, in my early 20s and started hunting with a camera and binoculars. So I haven't shot anything since then. But um, the colors are stunning. Uh, the habitat's perfect. This is Sunset Pond at North Chagrin Reservation. If you go there the first week of October um, and get on the boardwalk that goes across the pond right off of the Nature Center, there's a large maple tree that will turn yellow. And at 8, 8 o'clock to 8.30 in the morning, the sun is just coming up over the trees. The sunlight hits that yellow tree and it creates a gold palette on the water. And there's all the goofball people like me with cameras that are laying on our bellies, trying to get eyeball to eyeball with these beautiful birds on this beautiful golden palette. So um, that's more than you wanted to know. The other, um, other uh, tree duck that we're liable to come across in the east is the uh, black-bellied whistling duck. This was actually in Findlay, Ohio many years ago. One came there on the Ohio Birds Listserv and I happened to be traveling and and found it there. But go down to South Carolina, there's a lot of them. You can see the Spanish moss. They hang out in trees, just like the woodies do. Um, they're pretty cool to, to follow. They've got some characteristic wing patterns. You don't even have to memorize. You just know with those fleshy feet. And look at that goofy posture. That is the weirdest thing. And they fly like that all the time. Go, 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 go. You're just waiting for them to do a Forrest Gump thing or something like that, you know? So um, beautiful birds uh, here. You find hooded mergansers. I, we don't have to talk about ducks a lot, but you got to hear this one because they're first, they're beautiful ducks. You will find them in woodland settings and things like this. You also find them on open lakes during migration. Um, but listen. <laughs> you can actually hear that across the lake sometimes if it's still enough and there's a lot of them during migration. Even during the, the winter migration, they'll make that noise springtime for sure. So um, a lot of other ducks you're going to see is the American black duck. You're going to see redheads and gadwalls and pintails and canvasbacks and ringneck ducks. Am I, am I okay? So if, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, greater and lesser scup. Which one's the greater, top or bottom? Not nah, the bottom. Look at how the round, the head's really rounded and the bill is slightly larger. This is really relative, okay? It's not means your cousin or anything like that. They, you really need them side by side to see that little more pointiness of the bird up on top. And the nail, the black tip of the bill is supposed to be a little bit darker. Um, and I may be wrong, but that's what I'm calling it. So, um, but uh, yeah, they're really hard to differentiate the two scop from one another. Northern shoveler, that's not hard. Um, we can all get that one. And ruddy ducks and blue winged teal and green winged teal and bald pates. So some of you, but yeah, bald pates, that's right there with uh, golden swamp warbler. So uh, American widgeon in there. The rare and elusive Canada goose on top of a muskrat mound inside of a wetland for sure. This was in a marina in, in um, uh, Mentor and see the little baby under the wing. That's kind of cool. Everybody a collective, ah, oh, for the little cute duck. Okay, we won't get into that. All right, so bazillion of them. So if you're a golfer, you have a love-hate relationship with them, okay? Trumpeter swans, we inter they introduced them back to Ottawa. That's that. It's my sixth grader practicing his trumpet. If you've been on the boardwalk in, in May at McGee Marsh, you've heard these guys because they're all in the background all the time calling. Um, the way you tell them from the tundra swans is their bill goes back to the eye and almost totally encompasses the eye. Whereas the, uh, tr the tundra swans bill will come to a point uh, at about nine o'clock on the bird's eye. Uh, the bill is also slightly little different confirmation. Plus, you won't find trumpeter swans in a wetland. They need too much, um, they need too much uh, surface area to flap in and cross to get. So a lot of the wetlands are smaller where the trumps seem to have no problem with that at all. This one, 3A0, I, I photographed for several years in a row. This goes back more than 10 years ago when they were introducing them. And um, it was kind of cool to monitor the same bird. And that's what a baby looks like. And we call baby swans cygnets, right? Very good. And the plant in the background is? American Lotus. Thank you, Nancy. Very good. 
All right, so we're going to hustle through these Gruer formies, cool word, and that encompasses a lot of these other critters. I often thought that the cranes, because of their size, should have been in with the other wading birds, but they're not. That's not how they're organized. Um, so uh, this is Florida, uh, but we do have a lot of them. Uh, Sandy Ridge Reservation has some. Uh, I live in Geauga County, as I've said many times, and we have the Cuyahoga Wetlands, which is Burton Wetlands, all the way down to Ladue Reservoir. And there's a lot of marshlands there and along the upper Cuyahoga River. And we have about 45 of them um, every year when we do the crane count in April. So we feel very fortunate to have uh, the habitat, which is the limiting factor. Um, they need to have flooded um, woodlands, uh, a swamp or a marsh with a lot of vegetation in it to have their babies. And then they go out and they forage in fields. So um, here they are just dancing around over there at the celery fields. Here's Sarasota. This is a first year bird, uh, does not have the red cap. And I think this adult looks like an ostrich. I think it was all wet in the morning. This was early morning and it was probably down in the, the vegetation there. And I think they're gonna listen. I love that sound. So uh, full uh, disclosure here, all the sounds come from my Sibley app on my phone. It's a $20 app, my Sibley field guide, and it has all the sounds in it. And all I do is just insert them as a, a file into here. So that's where all the sounds came from. Um, the common gallinu, a, a much more popular bird in the Southeast, but we've got a few of them up here. This is actually um, part of their breeding territory, but we don't see many of them. Uh, really cool bird, reminds you of a coot in there. Uh, babies um, are just gangly, if you will. Another crazy sound we'll hear on here, but they mostly eat vegetation, but they'll also eat um, seeds and, um, and little insects and things like that. Isn't nature grand? <laughs> it causes you to laugh, smile out, you know, that sort of a thing. Purple gallinus, uh, related, a much smaller bird. Uh, this is Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, just before you get into um, Savannah, Georgia. Um, just a wonderful place, a four mile loop that you can drive around if you ever get down to the Hilton Head, Savannah area. Um, it was closed for three years after hurricane and now they're opened up again. Um, but you can see them here. They eat lots of dragonflies. And um, this is the first bird I ever saw. This is someplace over here near Columbia Station or something here on the west side. Do you remember that bird, Nancy, when it was there? It was a celebrity, but this goes back more than 10 years. And it was so close that my 400 millimeter lens needed nine feet minimum, and it was just barely in focus. So the bird was that close. But here's the babies um, that you can see them walking through here. Uh, and following the parent through the through the wetland. Soras, we have plenty of those around here. Um, little chickens, I call them. You can hold them in the palm of your hand. When they run away, they're like a deer. They pick up their big white tail and off they go. Virginia rails, um, uh, same habitat, little different looking bird, the bill length here. Both of them will eat um, a lot of creatures. The Sora will eat more seeds and stuff like that and vegetation, but both of them will eat everything. This one's predominantly more uh, into the animal life that it eats. Really cool looking birds of different striations and everything on the rails. We're gonna look at a couple other rails here like the King Rail. Anybody know where Honda Wetlands is outside of Columbus? That's a great, lo great location. When I was selling down in the Columbus area, I, I birded a lot there um, after hours, of course, after I saw my clients. Um, this bird was just out in the open there. Uh, it's freshwater specific, okay? And um, I bring it up because the clapper rail is saltwater specific. And I know that because when I took these pictures um, uh, here, this one especially, this was at Savannah again. And I got a note from the reviewer, eBird reviewer, and said, what side of the dike was this bird on? And because one side of the dike is freshwater and the other side is saltwater and wanted to be sure I knew what I was looking at. And that's when I learned I was wrong that day. I have not been wrong since. So uh, <laughs> I know where the salt water is and I know I'm not looking at a king rail. I'm always looking at a clapper rail uh, and vice versa. Anybody ever hear the limpkins? 
Yeah, they're uh, pretty crazy. Um, down around the golf courses and things like that, um, another uh, bird of the marsh, they love apple snails. This is an internet picture, as is this one here. So if you see this um, on the cattails and stuff, listen for that. It'll drive you nuts. My wife is not a birder, but she knows to call the limkin. So um, other birds you're likely to see, the anhingas, the water turkeys. These guys are another beautiful thing. This is black and white photography. Steve Kagan and Kirtland Bird Club takes a lot of beautiful black and white photography. Um, these guys have been called different kind of names, devil bird and so on, because all you see is their neck coming out. This is a female or a first-year male. They nest in trees. Uh, they're in that rookery at... Um, uh, over at uh, right here. This is a rookery picture from Ibis Pond. Their babies look pretty good um, when they're coming out. These lovely soft colors, which are very different, but they stab. They stab their prey and get it. And then they flip it around up in the air. And I mean, all you're seeing is this neck and there's all this bird under the water, um, which is why they have to put their wings out to dry off. Stunning colors again, but that looks lethal. I wouldn't want to be trying to handle that bird. Beautiful eyes. This is my favorite picture I have ever taken in all time. Uh, it was at an early morning on a wetland in um, near Vero Beach, Florida. We were down there, this is about three or four years ago. And actually I have a picture with a complete reflection in the water. And I have a good friend who's an artist. And she said, I wanna paint a picture for you. And I gave her the picture with the reflection in it and she painted it for me and almost brought me to tears. I just, I don't know, it looks, almost looks like an Asian type scene or something like that, it reminds you. Um, that sort of a thing, but that's just the fog in the background and it's just dumb luck. Even a squirrel can find a nut once in a while, get a good picture. So, um, pied billed grebes. I like the winter per plumage better than the spring plumage. Okay. So pied is means two colors. You can see the, uh, marking on the bill. Um, this is an internet picture. Aren't their babies the cutest darn things? Little zebras. So why did I include this? Because this is the only picture I have of a baby pied bill grebe, and that doesn't really do it justice, does it? This is at McGee Marsh. You got to go out in a mosquito infested marsh in the summertime to find these babies. And I'm just not, it's not a high priority picture for me. There's a lot of other things I'll do from mosquitoes rather than that. They eat everything. They eat fish and they eat frogs and they eat tadpoles and all sorts of things. You're liable to see any number of, of shorebirds during migration. Uh, we've got, let me go back here. So we've got Dunlin there on the top left. This is a wonderful machine they have at the boss unit of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, which is on the south side of Route 2. They drive it over the mud, stirs up all the critters underneath there. And these are all Dunlin in the air around it. Um, we thought they were going to scare them away. We weren't going to see anything. What they did was it attracted them. They got used to this machine kicking up food for them. We have Wilson Snipe on the right that starts showing up, you know, in March and April um, in Ohio. And they'll, they're a wetland bird too. So they'll go in and out of the wetlands and onto the terrestrial. Uh, some Dowichers over here, uh, sandpipers, uh, solitary sandpiper, greater and lesser yellow legs, another great picture serendipity that you got the lesser on the left and the greater on the right uh, for that. Um, I think this is a semi-palmated sandpiper. Those of you who know sandpipers better than me, I, I hate sandpipers. You know, I always go to look for them. So this is going to go quickly. Passerins, you've got kingfishers, you've got blackbirds out there. Female looks like a, a big sparrow. It's the babies. We were being dive bombed at Holden when we were taking this picture. We took it and ran. Um, here's a red wing uh, protecting its territory. There was a nest, we can be sure, somewhere inside. Again, Ira Road Marsh at the Beaver Pond. And this great blue heron was just walking the edges, probably looking for fish, but it would turn its head and eat the babies out of the nest if it could find them. So the blackbird was protecting its territory. Yellow warblers, all the bushes along the edge of the wetland will have them. Uh, the golden swamp warbler. No? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's my program. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is just north on the trail from from the boardwalk and the the observation boardwalk there at Ira Road, Beaver Pond, and that stump in the middle there. I watched this bird for an hour coming back and forth. It just happened as I was walking by that the bird came by and perched on the side of it and was feeding the babies inside. 
So it doesn't take much of a cavity for cavity nesting birds. And it doesn't have to be a round hole. So they, um, they're very adaptable. Down south, you will see, what is it? Painted bunting, thou shalt not covet thy friends painted bunting on their life list. Go find your own. Um, they're, they're just, they look like, a, like an AI generated bird, don't they? Uh, so this is a, maybe my best picture of them eating these tiny, tiny seeds. And this was in, in the, um, uh, the wildlife refuge at Pinckney and along the edges. But um, so it's part of the maritime forest which is part of the, I just subbed it in because it's a beautiful bird and I was looking for a justification to show it to you. So there we go, common yellow throat, all it needs is a branch and a wet spot. As you all know, uh, the male is gorgeous, easy to identify, first year male here getting into his colors. Um, they love this kind of habitat and you find, anytime you find thickets, you're gonna find birds. Tree swallows, they uh, compete with the prothonotaries for uh, nesting cavities. Oh, I'm sorry, golden swamp warblers. And they love to get these big dragonflies and they'll shove them right in the mouth of the baby. So they're really kind of cool. Um, by the time the babies are done, as you all know, probably those of you experienced, the swallows of different kinds start grouping together. We used to have the big push down at Nimicilla years ago where you have tens of thousands of birds, uh, but you'll see them at the end of the day coming together and then they disperse through the day. Northern flicker will hang out in some of these wetlands because uh, while it likes to have uh, ants and things on the ground, it wants a nesting cavity in a nice dead tree. So it will compete with other cavity nesters up there. And that's just a kind of cool shot. I threw in the yellow shafted flicker. Um, they put the yellow shafted and the red shafted together several years ago and became the Northern flicker. So if you're in Seattle, that yellow is all red. Uh, swamp sparrow, we're not gonna, we're, we're, we're really winding down, okay? So um, my favorite sparrow, because I like the habitat, I like wetlands, and I love the red colors, the olive in the face, the face patch, all this stuff kind of come together. It's right there with, uh, with the Lincoln sparrow. Those are my two favorite sparrows. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but it's the bird I'm looking at today. That's the one I'm happy with. So we're finishing up. I'm just going to quickly go through. When you're out there, if you're a nature nerd, you will find dragonflies and damselflies, and you will find uh, butterflies, and you'll find sweat bees, the different metallic sweat bees of different sorts, and wine wasps on the flowers, and bullfrogs, and alligators if you're far enough south. Um, you'll find snakes, and you'll find what kind of turtle? Blanding's turtle, very good. Somebody's been to McGee on the bo back boardwalk, right on the east side. You can see them in that waterway in there. And that's where that picture came from. And you'll find big old snapping turtles. This was actually, that's all mud. This is an April shot at Holden Arboretum. And I'm laying on my stomach about from here to the wall back there, okay? Because <laughs> I know that that's not to be messed with. And you'll find the painted turtles in there too. And occasionally the beaver that created the wetland, which are really cool to watch. And the fawn that hangs out in the vegetation along the edge of it. And is this a muskrat or is this a meadow vole? It's a meadow vole. It is, it's just a, a big blown up picture of a meadow vole, but it does look like it should be a muskrat, <laughs> it's big. And if you see mink once in a while um, in the wetlands, and there's your muskrat, always got a mouthful of vegetation and possums and Rory raccoon will be there and occasionally a weasel. This is along the, the wetlands, riparian wetlands of the upper Cuyahoga River. And there they are, the fiddler crabs. So country Western stars and different kinds of spiders, which I kind of think are cool at a distance. Um, longhorn beetles of different kinds. I also love entomology. Flies, which are, besides fungi, they're the first things, the first flying things to get onto a dead carcass or an animal dropping because they lay their eggs and two days later, the, larval, the larvae hatch out of those eggs and begin to de the decomposition process. They are so critical. I know we're grossed out by them. They're so critical to that stage of the environment, just like the vultures are. Um, and what was that last one? There's an, a green bottle fly. And I'm done. Thank you very much. So if, if there's a question or two, or we have enough time, or are we going to be thrown out of the room? Yes, okay. Yeah, oh, we want to we make sure. We're getting the microphones. Here. Yep. 
Hi, uh, you showed some pictures of Florida. What time of the year was that? We generally, my wife and I generally went to Florida during the winter for like one week. We don't um, have the means to, uh, uh, to go down there and rent a house for six months. Plus we have horses at home. <laughs> so we, we can't leave, leave them for that. But um, anytime during uh, from December, January, February, those would be good months to go down there. The Hilton Head Island pictures, our daughter and her husband have a timeshare at Hilton Head. So we go down there about every third year. And that's when I visit that wildlife refuge at Pinckney and Savannah National Wildlife Refuge in June, usually. So any other? Any other? Oh, oh Marianne. And over are there? there any questions from folks that are Zooming? No, no questions. Zooming questions. You know you've done a good job when there's no questions. Yes. At, at the very beginning, you had a marsh there. What was the name of it? With all oh, the birds in the video. So that that is Pinckney National Wildlife Refuge, uh, just outside the border of Hilton Head Island. And that was Ibis Pond, I-B-I-S. And it's about a 10 minute walk from the parking lot. You drive into Pinckney off the big highway. You got to be careful. It's nuts. The people down there, traffic is horrible. But once you get on there, you drive about a half a mile back to a parking lot and you walk about 10 minutes and you get to Ibis Pond. And it's just amazing. It's well worth the walk. Any other questions? Well, I'll stick around for a few minutes so we get thrown out if there's anything else. So thank you all very much again. That would be lovely. Thank you. And and thank every I thank everyone for joining us, the folks on Zoom, the folks that arrived here. Uh, again, check out some things at the back table, pick up the uh, coffee cards. There's a couple of books back there. Please, they are free. They are free. Uh, calendars are free. The newsletter is back there. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Safe, safe trip home. <laughs>